Welcome to the Omni Stage at Event Tech Live USA and Canada 2021 and to our next session of the program. I'm delighted to welcome Head of Events at Stroke Association UK, Mr. Tony Banks, joining us now. Tony, a very good evening to you in the UK. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for the, for the intro, James. Nice to be with you. Yeah, not a problem at all. As I said, good evening in the UK, a good afternoon, just gone four o'clock in New York and Toronto, just gone three in Chicago and just gone one o'clock in Vancouver and San Francisco. And over to you, Tony. I'll see you a little bit later on with some questions from our audience. Oh, huge thanks, James, for the introduction. And again, welcome everybody tuning in from the US and Canada and of course, anywhere else in the world where you're joining from today. My name is Tony Banks, Head of Conference and Events at the Stroke Association in the UK. We are the UK's biggest charity for people affected by stroke. I've been running events in the charity sector for over 10 years. And currently at the Stroke Association, my team is responsible for a programme of conference and events aimed at driving engagement, raising awareness, of course, raising funds and supporting our beneficiaries and professionals who work in stroke care. Really pleased to be part of Event Tech Live today. My session is gonna focus on running successful events for healthcare professionals during a global pandemic. Now, I have around 20 minutes, so I'm gonna break this down into three short sections for you. First, I'll tell you about how we planned and created our event, so the why and the who. I'm gonna move on to the delivery of the event next, the what and the when. And then finally, I'll talk to you about some of the outcomes and how we engaged our audiences through this event. So if I start with the why and the who, so loss of income through events has been hugely damaging, hugely damaging for everyone in the event sector in the last year. Uh, but for a charity, uh, it's been much more damaging than just loss of income. So our events raise money, yes. They also raise awareness of our cause, drive engagement, grow our audience, amplify our voice, maximize our brand. I could go on and on. And I know this is not news to you all either. This will be something that you'll be considering for your events too. As a charity as well, our events also give us the chance to engage healthcare professionals, to bring them together, to learn, to develop their careers, to share best practice. And we provide a chance through our events for participants to take action and improve the recoveries of people affected by stroke. So our program essentially provides a lifeline to the 1.3 million people living with stroke in the UK because the professionals that come through our event are learning, are sharing best practice, and are able to provide better outcomes for people affected by stroke as a result. The event I'm talking about today is called the UK Stroke Forum. It's one of the world's largest multidisciplinary conferences for people working in stroke care. So to start off with, I'll tell you a little bit about where we came from. And as a face-to-face -face event, we would have been running it with around 1500 participants at the ICC in Birmingham. This obviously didn't happen due to the pandemic last year. We had to cancel, but as a three day face to face, we would have been seeing people coming together, innovating, celebrating groundbreaking research through a scientific program. Um, but as I say, unfortunately, like everybody else, we had to cancel the event as a face-to-face. -face. So we quickly put a strategy in place to try and continue to meet our objectives by taking the event virtual, something I really don't mind admitting with you all today, that you know that was very new to us as a team at the time. And we were certainly learning as we went along with the elements of, of developing virtual events at that stage. Before anything else, before we began actually putting the event together, we carried out some audience insight work we used online survey tools to do this, this piece of work, but it allowed us to know exactly what people working in stroke wanted from an online event experience from us. In particular, um, it helped us to better understand the priorities for those healthcare professionals who were working during the pandemic. Many of these professionals were working on the front line, dealing with the challenges of COVID in one hand, whilst trying to support people affected by stroke in the other, and to be honest, we didn't think that learning and development and attending online events would be something that healthcare professionals would be able to dedicate their time through in the height of the pandemic. But when we spoke to professionals, they told us that they still wanted to connect to other people working in the field of stroke, 
And in fact, sharing best practice and learnings from the pandemic felt more important to them than ever before. So it gave us a huge reason to take the event virtual and continue to try and pull this event off. We asked them when they wanted to access the events online and how they wanted to access the events. And due to how busy their day jobs were during the, the pandemic itself, we quickly realized that um, an accessible, timely, on-demand amount of content was gonna be you know, absolutely essential and critical to deliver, delivering a successful event. The, the biggest learning for us in planning stage, I think was co-designing the event with our audience. So that was essential in getting things right for them, allowing them to shape the program, to tell us what was a priority for them was absolutely essential in securing an event that people wanted to engage with. So if I move on to the what and the when, I mentioned how important it was to try and develop a version of our pre-existing face event and bring that online. Actually, I think for us, what we found was that, and this is something we're continuing to learn, I think all of us are continuing to learn, that recreating your face-to-face -face event is very difficult to do virtual. Virtual is very different to face-to-face, -to -face, and I think you know we're starting to believe that our event will be much more successful if we don't try to recreate every element of the face-to-face -face experience when running it online. We wanted to bring people experiences that have been trickier for us to perhaps do face-to-face. -face. Running it virtually allowed us to innovate, to use clever tech, to be much more data-driven and much more interactive and creative when engaging our audiences. And I think picking the right platform for us was essential. We needed experts in delivering scientific content. It's an academic conference. So yes, that was really, really important for us. I think most importantly, we needed a platform which allowed us to deliver something new, something interactive and pretty groundbreaking for this group of people, healthcare professionals. Typically in the UK, I don't think we're um, attending lots of virtual events pre-pandemic. So this was a new experience for them as, as much as it was for us, I think. So I suppose the big learning from, from this for us was around um, one size does not fit all when it comes to selecting your event platform. Every event's different, different requirements and different needs. And I think what we found is by selecting a provider with your audience as top priority, allows you to find a suitable audience for them with their needs in mind. And actually an entirely different platform might be suitable for your next event. You don't have to stick with one supplier and that's absolutely okay. We're starting to find ourselves working with a variety of platform providers and this allows us to bring different experiences for different audiences with different needs. So just before I come on to the outcomes, a uh, little video, 30 second clip, just which hopefully brings the event to life for you. Very little flavour of, of the event for you there, just a quick video to kind of bring it to life. Um, I'm going to move on briefly now to talk through some of the learnings and the experience that we gained as a result of delivering that conference at the end of last year in December 2020. I'm going to focus on four key areas for the purposes of this part of the presentation. Um, in terms of flexibility, I think when I, I think about flexibility, we're talking about through the whole event experience. Um, some examples of that, so flexible ticket prices was something we put in place. Um, moving the event online obviously allowed us to run it as a cheaper experience for event participants um, in comparison to the face-to-face -face conference that they would have attended. Things like accommodation fees as well for traveling to the event. Um, participants didn't need to worry about that uh, with the virtual experience. But actually also um, by creating much more affordable registration fees, we were able to um, access a wider audience. You know, our reach certainly grew from more affordable registration fees. People with lived experience of stroke, so people living with a disability, living with stroke, were able to be much more involved in the event. 
Um, and also students, those aspiring to have a career in, in healthcare and, and stroke, um, typically probably wouldn't have been able to afford maybe the three-day conference as a face-to-face -face experience. So flexible ticket prices ensured we increased our reach. And actually we did that by around 66%, um, taking it virtual in comparison to the face-to-face. -face. So a huge drive in numbers coming through the doors in the first instance was you know, a huge success for us. In terms of flexibility as well, I think offering our sponsors more value for money was something we were able to do by being very, very flexible with them. We were able to work with them to understand what success looked like for our sponsors. So things like data capture, brand awareness, uh, engagement with the audience, and ultimately, I suppose, sales for our sponsors was what they were telling us they needed. And for many, I think just simply recreating a standard exhibition booth for them on the online platform wasn't going to be enough for them, it wasn't going to tick all of those boxes. So by being flexible and developing a very flexible sponsorship package for them and with them, we were able to put in place things like sponsored symposiums, we had bonus content, we integrated videos into the platform for them, instant messaging, so they were able to directly chat to the attendees of the event and having things like measurable click-throughs that were able to see you know, the traffic that we were pointing to their website, all of that data capture that we were able to get and provide them access to that data and all of those measures has meant actually as a result of that, we've seen a much higher retention of sponsors for our event this year that's taking place. Around 85% so far signed up to attend this year that were part of the experience last year. So retention has been really great from a sponsorship perspective. And then of course, in terms of flexibility, obviously offering on-demand relevant accessible talks um, that are available to participants, not just live, but obviously whenever it suited our audiences. And again, our audience being healthcare professionals, um, it meant we were able to give them greater freedom and due to the pandemic, many working you know, longer hours, working in, in their workplaces for extended times, they're able to interact with us when it suited them uh, and making the content as well, where possible, evergreen, uh, having that kind of real long shelf life and making it relevant beyond the live event itself, meant that you know even six months down the line, we're still selling in that content to people on demand. And it's, you know, it's not only boosted our sales beyond the live event that took place in December, but we're keeping the engagement levels high. Uh, people are still talking about it, still accessing com content now, and, and it's actually you know, leading up to opening registrations for this year's event. It's still got people talking about last year's event, which is you know, excellent marketing for us as well. In terms of the other key learning for us, I think incentives were, were really key for us. And this was something, you know, moving online, we were able to play around with this a little bit too. So being an academic conference, uh, CPD accreditation was something we always had in place for our face-to-face -face conferences. It was a huge incentive for people to attend the event. It's one of the highest reasons people gave us for coming to the event was to gain CPD points. And it ensured, um, you know, for us having that in place, it ensured that we're able to award people their points still, but we're able to do it in a very different way to what it would have been face to face. So they were awarded their points through interaction with the sessions that they actually attended. And again, using an online platform, we were able to measure and see the parts of the platform people visited. So as a result of that, we found that engagement with the conference overall was very, very high uh, in comparison to some of our other virtual events, certainly that we held last year. Over 80% of attendees that joined us um, spent over 10 hours or more on the virtual platform over the course of three days. And we felt that was a very you know, high level of engagement from our audience. And again, that CPD incentive really helped to retain people on the platform throughout the three days. We also used um, gamification to incentivize our audiences. There were prizes for attendees who visited the most sponsor booths, attended the most sessions, accessed the most content throughout the entire platform. This increased traffic in particular to our sponsors. Again, we were able to measure that and give that information and relay it back to our sponsors, keeping them happy. We had things like interactive quizzes built into the platform as well. Little bit of fun, but also something a bit more social, uh, which gave attendees the chance to be added to like a leaderboard. And again, kept that engagement level um, quite high through incentivization. 
I think the other big thing for us that we focused on when we took it virtual was content, um, something key for any event success, obviously. I think for us, understanding healthcare professionals and, and the insight work that we carried out pre-event allowed us the chance to, to, to completely understand what it was they wanted from our event, which topics to them were most relevant. Um, we, in fact, we, over, you know, we completely overhauled our content for this event. We moved away from the kind of standard death by PowerPoint um, style presenta presentations that, you, you know, academic conferences are very presentation heavy as a face-to-face -face experience. We were very conscious that people were joining us for a three-day virtual experience and we had to move to a much more TED style present presentation format, um, allowing people to, you know, have shorter, snappier access to the presentations. And we were very conscious, you know, people would be spending longer periods of time at their desks um, in comparison to the face-to-face -face event, where they'd be up and about, moving around conference halls and things. So um, that's certainly something that we wanted to put in place from the outset. And I think you know, we achieved that very, very well. Uh, as an academic conference as well, we would usually have things like poster tours. And we built in the poster tours by allowing people to pre-record two minute short videos, which were able, you know, available to people to view on demand. Um, recreating what was a really popular element of the uh, um, face-to-face -face conference for us. And then again, due to the pandemic, one of the things that we really focused on in terms of our content was a shift away from some of the scientific stuff and more of a focus on well-being. We were recognising what an incredibly difficult period it had been for healthcare professionals. And we ran live well-being sessions as part of the conference which people were able to particip participate in. I think you had hundreds of people join in morning yoga sessions live with us, live exercise classes, mindfulness sessions, you know, a much stronger focus on mental health um, through our content itself. Again, kept engagement levels high and brought something new to a program that people hadn't really experienced with us before. And the final key learning I just wanted to mention was when we planned our content in particular, one of the things that we ensured happened was that we co-delivered the program with people affected by stroke. Every single session that we ran had at least one person who had lived experience of stroke sharing their story. It made presentations so much more powerful. And I think, you know, what better way to get a message across and to hear from the people we're here to support ourselves. So every session had a stroke survivor talking. Every session had someone sharing their personal experience of stroke making everything much more memorable as an experience. And again, hopefully keeping that engagement level high. This was something that was consistent throughout the entire program and something we we're really proud of. Um, final point for me um, in terms of learnings was around marketing. So uh, we fully integrated our event marketing into all social media platforms. We created a pre-event buzz from this, but it actually allowed people to network. And I think this was something that we definitely learned last year. Something I think that's been more of a struggle to recreate uh, with online events is that networking element. And I know there are lots of very clever tech tools that are doing this. We utilized a lot of that through the event itself, allowing our attendees to talk to each other. We also use social media throughout. So doing live tweet chats during the event brought in a global audience. We were having people contributing to the chats all over the world. Also seen that peer to peer. So it wasn't just us facilitating conversation. It was much more around people networking very much like they would do in a face to face conference. And we used the fact that we were online as a chance to really attract speakers from across the globe. Um, typically, as a charity, we wouldn't be able to afford to bring in speakers globally to a conference like this. So this was a real opportunity for us in a quite cheap and accessible way to get some of the top speakers from stroke across the globe to join our conference. So we had government ministers, top NHS speakers, um, celebrity supporters joined us. And even uh, in some sessions, we were able to bring in speakers from third world countries who were battling the challenges of COVID in a very different way to certainly us here in the UK, um, sharing their first hand experience through the technology that we were using was um, quite a groundbreaking part of the conference for us, bringing in speakers we would never have been able to have done had it been face-to-face. -face. And of course, from a marketing perspective, we were able to sell all of this in advance of the event, um, knowing that we were gonna have 
access to this variety and this wealth of incredible speakers allowed us for a much more stronger marketing campaign too. That's all from me. Uh, thank you for listening. My details are pop on screen now and I'm happy to take any questions that any of you may have on what you just heard. Tony, um, thank you very much, first of all. Um, the, the, the subject of non, uh, not-for-profit organisations and charities um, has cropped up actually in some of the sessions earlier on today um, because a lot of the focus with event tech is, you know, is on very high-end solutions and, you know, for an organisation such as yours where ultimately the end game is to raise awareness and to raise money for the particular organisation, for the charity, you don't necessarily have that. And that's something I'll come to with a question um, in a few minutes, if that's okay. But first, we've got some sure. questions that have come in during your session um and very very pertinent um so first of all a really obvious one but a couple of our uh, audience members are wanted to know what platform did you use for the event um we used a platform called intrado um so this wasn't a decision we took lightly we did a lot of scoping for this um we actually had around five or six companies pitch to us uh, it's, it was our biggest contract with a, an online supplier for our event all year we ran lots of online events last year and so this was a huge contract for us. Intrado for us um, won the contract based on not only their ability to deal with the scientific side of things but some of the groundbreaking tech that they were demonstrating um, really kind of stood out for us and you know we felt like it was going to bring a really different experience for our event attendees. Mm -hmm. And would you mind um, maybe just just very briefly telling us a little bit about your experience of going through the sort of the process of finding that supplier, how you found that? Because I know this is something that an awful lot of organisers have had to, to do in the last 12 months is go through that minefield of, of listening to pitches and doing their own research. Um, how sort of how much of a headache did it give you um, and how long did the process take ultimately? I mean, we, we certainly spent a lot of time going through the process. I mentioned in my presentation that, you know, running virtual events for many event organizers was, was quite new to us. So we wanted to get this right. This was really important to us. The conference success really, really did depend upon having the right platform in place. You know, uh, I'd say that there weren't um, elements of the conference that weren't perfect um, and certainly learnings that we'll take away and improve on as we kind of pull together hopefully an enhanced experience for the conference this year based on everything that we learned. But, you know, I think we, we did a lot of research. We spoke to a lot of other charities that were running academic conferences, scientific conferences, and tried to work out, you know, who the shortlist was going to be based on pe other people's experiences that had been there a little bit sooner than we had. Um, and really get to that kind of, you know, the, the final few that were, we were really confident in. Um, and then it was down to, you know, some of the important things that you've mentioned, James, like the, the, obviously the cost for a charity is absolutely essential. Bringing down those costs allows us to ensure any money made from the conference goes to people affected by stroke themselves. So um, something affordable, but still, you know, that white glove experience that we were going to provide was really, really important for us. We, we wanted to retain those audiences. So making sure that they came back, they enjoyed their experience, they didn't forget their experience was really important. Fantastic. Um, again, a, a platform related question that's come in via Glissa during the session, Tony. Um, did you use a standalone gamifica gamification solution to plug into the um, Entrado platform or was it an all in one solution? It was all in one. Um, so that was one of the features that really attracted us to, to working with Entrado. Um, they had some built in features. We were able to bring then some of our pre existing. Um, games that we'd created specifically, you know, at the Stroke Association, they were themed around mm -hmm. stroke. Um, so we were able to embed them into the platform. Um, so things like the quizzes that I mentioned is something we'd had, you know, produced for our face-to-face -face conferences and we were able to actually bring that and put that in place. So um, definitely one of the features that attracted us. We got really high engagement um, rates from the gamification part of it and, you know, the incentivization that I mentioned was really, really key for us. Um, and, it, you know, it also allowed us to drive traffic to you know, sponsors in particular, which has kept the sponsors happy as a result of it. So um, yeah, I feel the gamification element worked really, really well. Something we'll definitely be building upon for this year's conference too. 
Fantastic. One final quick uh, point and question that I'd like to put to you, Tony. It's not so much a tech-related question, but to do with your actual audience. Given the nature of what was going on, what was what is still going on at the moment, but what happened last year, was there a desire amongst the healthcare professionals that you are engaging with to communicate, given what they were all going through last year? Yeah, I think so. One of our biggest worries and concerns was that people were so caught up and rightly so in dealing with the pandemic, working on the front line. Our concern as an organization was that what the conference usually brings um, to to the world of stroke is is game changing, policy changing, uh, innovation and sort of really celebrating stroke research and moving stroke research forward. Um, We were worried that was going to stop and halt as a result of you know, people focusing, as I say, rightly so on the pandemic, but kind of forgetting about stroke research in particular. And we've seen some of that stroke research is going to be underfunded moving forward because of the impact of the pandemic. But the need to communicate, the need to share that learning and you know, bring best patches together was absolutely vital. Um, and I think for us, it was pretty groundbreaking that we were able to do that like during last year. We could have easily cancelled and just said, you know, look, we'll park this or we'll come back to it once the pandemic, we're through the pandemic, but um, we put ourselves out there and I think it really paid off and it's kept stroke on the map as a result, you know, that communication between our attendees, but also between us as a charity and our attendees, having that voice has really kept stroke, um, you know, you know, as an important element in, in policy, in the in the government, um, as it stands right now, it's, it's obviously, it's right up there still. So, you know, it was key for us. Absolutely. Well, you know, but on behalf of everybody, congratulations for uh, the success of what you managed to, to carry on delivering um, and the great work that the Stroke Association do, Tony. It's been great to have you at Event Tech Live um, today. Thank you very much for your session. We hope to see you soon. Tony Banks, everybody from the Stroke Association. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone.